Joining us now is founder of Inside the Middle East Institute, Avi Melamed. Thank you for joining, Avi. Thank you for having me. Avi, we're seeing that five revolutionary guards were killed in Syria in a strike that's attributed to Israel. Now, if indeed Israel did do this, it seems that it would be upping its game against Hezbollah and even Iran. Yes, well, that joins to a series of very painful blow that the Iranian regime, the Hezbollah, sustained, uh, particularly in the last couple of months. Um, from their perspective, there are two major uh, disturbing um, outcomes. First is the fact that the people that were get hit are very substantial in the whole infrastructure of the Iranians and the Hezbollah when it comes to intelligence gathering, cooperation, and, and um, movement of weapons. This is one aspect. The other aspect, which is not less bothering the Iranians, is the fact that it basically indicates there is a major intelligence breach within their ranks. And by the way, following the attack yesterday in Meza, in Damascus, uh, the Iranians already sent a very angry and furious message to the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. yeah, Iran said that um, IRGC Quds Force intelligence chief was among the dead um, in this strike on Syria. This is a top. Um, one of the top forces, right? Yes, Al-Quds Force is the spearhead uh, within the Islamic Revolutionary Guards. The Al-Quds Force is the one responsible for the whole coordination of the Iranian proxies across the region. Uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Iraqi Shiite militias, the Houthis in Yemen. So this is the most significant uh, force, reminding you that uh, four years ago, right at this time of the year, the commander of Al-Quds Force, uh, General, General Soleimani, was eliminated by the United States in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Now, what about a diplomatic solution with Lebanon? It seems to be exhausting itself. Um, we don't see progress, and Israel won't be waiting for you know an unlimited amount of time. At some point, this threat from the northern border for Israel will need to be addressed one way or the other, won't it? Yes, I guess so. But as of now, I don't see a substantial dramatic change in the major calculations of both sides, Israelis and the Hezbollah. And the bottom line is that, to the best of my understanding, both Israel and Hezbollah are not interested in dragging into a massive wide collision. So right now, what we see is the continuation of, on the one hand, the skirmish, uh, the military skirmish between the sides that is more or less limited in the end of the day to a more or less, roughly speaking, to the area of the Israeli-Lebanese border, South Lebanon, the northern part of Israel. It does not really exceed that physical region. And then there is another aspect of this um, uh, power struggle, roughly speaking, right now between Israel and Lebanon and Hezbollah. And when you see, when you look at the major uh, calculations of both sides, Israel on the one hand, Hezbollah on the other hand, you see that those major calculations that up until now actually forced restraint upon both Israel and Hezbollah, they are still in place, namely, Israel still wants to focus its uh, major military actions in uh, Gaza Strip. The Biden administration definitely discouraged Israel from expanding the war into the Lebanese arena. This is on the Israeli side. On the Lebanese side, Hezbollah definitely is tuned to the messages coming from Lebanon. The Lebanese people are saying very clearly, we don't want to be dragged into this war. Not less significant is the fact that uh, estimated some 100,000 uh, Lebanese from South Lebanon, which is the major political um, hub of Hezbollah, flee to the north. And they are also sending a very strong message to the Hezbollah that they don't really want to see their villages demolished. So in the end of the day right now, I don't see any dramatic change in those major calculations that uh, dictate, I would say, roughly speaking, up until now, the tactic and the policy of both sides, at least up until now. Mm -hmm. Now, the U.S. is pushing, certainly pushing for a big picture regional initiative, including the Saudis. And we know that um, normalization with the Saudis is a top priority for uh, the Israeli government, certainly for Netanyahu. This could definitely impact his legacy. Um, and But the current Israeli government will not necessarily agree to a Palestinian state. And that seems to be one of the conditions for the Saudi normalization. 
Yeah, well, when you read very closely and carefully what the Saudis are saying, they're not saying establishing a Palestinian state. They're basically saying laying the foundation towards a Palestinian state. There is a big difference between the things. And they know what they are saying. Look, the whole issue of Palestinian state right now is, is totally irrelevant, neither from the Israeli side nor from the Palestinian side. And by the way, I think that also from the American perspective. But in the end of the day, I think that uh, when you look at the large scheme of things, at least from Israeli perspective, I would say that Reminding us once again, the context of the war with Gaza Strip has to be large in the wider context of the story of the Iranian threat. It cannot be detached from that. And the Iranian threat in the end of the day, of the day presents a major challenge, not only to the Israel, not only to the region, but also to the world, as we see in the, what happened with the Houthis in the Red Sea and the Babel Mandab Strait. Now, when we are talking about specifically the Israeli-Hamas war, let us remind us if Hamas is not going to disappear, Israel is not going to totally eliminate Hamas. The objective in the end of the war should be basically to limit Hamas' ability in the end of the day to continue and dictate its radical agenda and the Iranian agenda as it was able to do until October 6. This is one major obje objective of that war. This is the realistic objective. Now, that objective calls for combination of military move, military pressure as we see today on the ground, and the diplomatic move. Now, in that context of the diplomatic move, we have the story of what is called the Palestinian state. Palestinian state is not going to be established, not tomorrow and not in the visible future. But the American administration would like actually the Israeli government to say yes to the process leading to a Palestinian state. That will also satisfy the Saudis. In the end of the day, the Saudis' long-term strategic interests definitely call for strengthening their relationship with Israel, particularly once again when they view how dangerous their neighbors are, the Houthis from the south and Iran from the east. So I think that this is the right way to look at things. There are certainly nuances here to the language and to uh, what is being said. We heard that also with Biden saying about how there are all sorts of different types of states um, when uh, when he was asked about a Palestinian state. Now, I want to ask you about um, Sky News is reporting that 75 were killed, 75 people were killed in American strikes in Yemen, including experts and aides of Hezbollah and the IRGC. Um, what are we seeing here, actually? Is this, Ameri well, this is, is this America striking back against, uh, against Iran, against the Houthis, the proxies? A couple of things to say about it. First, uh, the, the story of the presence of Hezbollah uh, personnel in, in Yemen, that they are training the Houthis, this is what we call a very well-known secret. <laughs> it is something that we know for a long period of time, no big surprise right there. Other aspect, yet again, it, it, it examples, it manifests how the Iranians were able to build this network of proxies and armies of terror across the Middle East. And by the way, in that context, the Lebanese Hezbollah is definitely playing a role of mentor. So sort of like a big brother, if you wish. That is correct in the context of the relationship between Hamas, Hezbollah, and Islamic Jihad. That is correct in the context of uh, the, the story of Hezbollah and the Houthis. And by the way, Hezbollah militants are also, to the best of my knowledge, also are involved in what's happening in the western part of North Africa in the Sahara story. We have to be tuned to that as well. The Iranians are extending their fingers everywhere possible across the Middle East. Now, the story of the Houthis in, in, in Yemen, the Houthis are presenting their attacks on a global shipment in, Yemen, in the Red Sea uh, under the excuse of supporting Gaza Strip and identifying with the Palestinians. The Houthis couldn't care less about the Palestinians. The Iranians couldn't care less about the Palestinians. By the way, the Iranian regime butchered thousands of Palestinians in Syria during the war. What we see here is actually a well-calculated Iranian tactic that aims to put pressure on the United States of America through exhausting and through holding the world hostage in the Red Sea, hoping that by doing that, they will put pressure on the United States of America to pressure Israel to stop the war in, uh, uh, against Hamas in Gaza Strip. So here is the picture. One Iranian proxy called Hamas and Islamic Jihad are holding Israelis and also to a large extent Palestinians hostages. Another major, uh, maybe D, D major Iranian proxy called Hezbollah in Lebanon is holding yet again Israelis and Lebanese hostages. Iraqi Shiite militias are holding Iraqis hostages. And the Houthis in Yemen are actually holding the world hostage. 
in the service of the Mullah regime. So when we see the formation of this alliance led by the United States, the guardians of prosperity, basically throating back or standing back against the Houthis, backed by the decision and the call of the United Nations Security Council to the Houthis to stop immediately the attacks. This is significant because in the context of the Middle East, there is very clear understanding that for the last decades, Iran, unfortunately, was able to dictate many, many developments in the region, and very, in most cases, very uh, negatively speaking. And, and the Iranian aggression was not really seriously uh, 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 confronted by the powers, uh, the global powers. It's about time that uh, this, this, this threat of the Iranian will be confronted. And in fact, when we look at the story of the uh, Houthis and the Red Sea, and we compare it to another story of red line, famous red line that uh, one of the American administration, the Obama administration, was drawing in the sand in the context of the use of chemical weapon in Syria. Mm -hmm. You see, there is a difference here because back then, in the story of the chemical weapon in Syria, the United States administration drew a, a line on the sand. That line was crossed. The United States, in the end of the day, did not basically uh, fulfill the ultimatum that it was setting. And then the bottom line was that. Assad regime continued to use chemical against weapon against its people. Here in the story of the Houthis, Biden administration and the U.S.-led coalition basically established that coalition, drew line in the water, if you want, not in the sand. And when the Houthis crossed it once again, there was a retaliation. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely that if the Houthis will continue those attacks, we will see more of this retaliation and probably maybe an increasing one. Avi Melamed, thank you for this thorough overview. Thank you. Thank you.